Welcome everyone to the Cup of Coffee podcast with me, your host, Tom Dillon. This has been recorded live as a weekly online meeting and broadcast around the world. Today's topic is Property Finance Masterclass with Sam Norris. Um, before we start, I'd like to sort of say by way of a disclaimer that today's a wonderful discussion, but that nothing said here constitutes financial advice. And you should always take professional advice before you invest in your hard-earned cash. There may be the odd unplanned swear word along the way as well. The form for today is that Sam will speak to us for a while, and then we'll be taking some questions from the floor. Uh, Sam Norris is the destru- disruptive force in Midlands property finance. With 20 years of expertise, he doesn't just secure funding. Oh, no. He ignites your investment engine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God, I love this. This is a great bio. His, um, I remember chuckling when I first read this. His, but it's not funny though. It's serious, by the way. This is, this is, this is Sam. His secret weapon is a tech savvy. This was written by someone who likes Transformers, isn't it? Um, his secret weapon is a tech savvy approach that cuts through red tape and delivers results at lightning speed. That's, it. I mean, I've, I've, I've done some stuff in property. I've never done anything at lightning speed, but maybe this is all about to change. Plus, he brings a unique personality that makes navigating the finance maze uh, an enjoyable ride. Good morning, Sam. Hello, how are we doing? Um, I've got I've got a really strange feeling that uh, that part of that might have been uh, generated by our friends over at ChatGPT um, <laughs> <laughs> last night. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a, so I've I've uh, I've I've recently I was saying to Julie off off air that um uh, that. My, my mum is my uh, my PA and I couldn't afford her if she wasn't my mum because she is a, a very, very well regarded, um, uh, she's not a PA, it's EA, isn't it? Executive assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and I've been I've been teaching her over the last sort of few months, the the power of AI. Um, so um, yeah, that's, 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 that's probably where some of that, some of that came from. But I stand by it all. I stand by yeah, it Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think every word, if you can deliver on that, like, forget it. You won't be, you know, you'll, you'll be. Well, I can do the lightning fast bit because I can get this done in the next 30 seconds. Like... <laughs> Excellent. Well, why don't you tell us some good stuff and then we'll have a chat after. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, look, uh, Tom, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me on. Uh, great to chat to you all today. And um, yeah, I suppose just to give you guys uh, to kick off a little bit of backstory to who I am. So um, as Tom said, my name is uh, Sam Norris. So I run a company called Grand Union Finance. Uh, we're based in the Midlands, although we've got people all over the country and we work with people not only all over the country, but all over the world. Um, and we have just a couple of months ago gone past our fourth anniversary. Um, so I think that puts us in like, the top 1% of all companies that are ever made that we've uh, managed to get past four years. Um, however, as Tom said, I've been doing this for a couple of decades now, um, believe it or not. Um, I am keeping just for men in business on my own um, hence why I look so youthful but um, I I actually started out um, at the uh, just before kind of the credit crunch I got my I got qualified as a mortgage broker just before then which uh, as it turns out is historically one of the worst times to ever become uh, a mortgage broker or, or anything in finance really and I and I fell into it completely by accident um, it is a funny story but I won't bore you, bore you too much about it but eventually essentially I went to the wrong interview um, I thought I was going to an interview for a stockbroker um, so I did a lot of research on stocks and shares and uh, turned up and t- it turns out it was a mortgage broker um, uh, uh, or trainee mortgage broker position, um, but I managed to get the job anyway. So either I've got the gift of the gab, or they were extremely desperate, uh, or a combination of the two. Um, but ever since then, um, you know, I've worked for various different companies, uh, some big, some not so big. Um, probably the most uh, well known company that I've worked for was at Sables, where um, I built their operations team um, back in the sort of the sort of two. Well, I know I was there during the, the London Olympics. Um, so not only am I a qualified mortgage broker, um, but I've worked in the industry in a, in a few different roles as well, which has enabled me to get, I think, a more holistic understanding of not only how products work, you know, how mortgages, bridging finance, development finance, commercial mortgages work, but the processing element behind it. Um, hence why in that incredible bio, you know, I say things like, you know, we, we like to use tech, we like to use, we, you know, we've got a big focus on customer service processing systems. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why my company Grand Union has been relatively successful over those uh, those first four years. And hopefully we the, the best is yet to come. Um, so I guess, the reason I'm here is to talk about finance, but probably to talk about a little bit more how finance impacts the wider property investment um, uh, industry, if you like. Now, I'm of the belief, you know, we've all heard, you know, when it comes to property investing, we've all heard um, the whole supply and demand uh, is the reason why uh, we uh, we have such a buoyant on the whole property market in the UK because there's less supply, supply than there is demand. Now, if you want to go into a little bit more depth on that, the supply is fueled 
I'm sorry, the demand is fueled by finance. Uh, before the, the mortgage was invented, very few people in the UK were able to afford to buy properties. We had a feudalistic system where people bought property um, and they were landowners, but there was a handful of people who did that and everyone else worked the land. The, the mortgage was invented and suddenly more and more people could afford to buy property. And then we have that that was the beginnings of the property market that we have today. So it underpins just how important finance is to the market and we've seen that recently with obviously things like the the, uh, the bank of england's base rate going up that has led to a uh, more limiting ability for people to acquire mortgages because of affordability and that has led to a drop off in the sales market we saw the same after brexit um when lenders were pulling back a little bit and, and we had a dip in the market and of, of course we had the credit crunch where literally there was no money um so people couldn't borrow it because there wasn't any to borrow so it's a really, really important thing to understand. And I I truly believe, and, and I'm, I'm using this because I've got a, a pretty wide net to cast in terms of my clientele, um, that those that have at least a reasonable basic understanding um, of the, um, uh, of the, um, uh, of finance and how it works generally tend to be the ones that I see succeeding more in property. Um, one of the great things about doing my job is I do get to speak to property investors all day, um, sometimes all night, it seems as well. And I get to see how many of them work. Some people that are really well known in the industry for being property investors are our clients. And it's nice to see behind the curtain to see that they're just human beings, the same as all of us, and they have their own issues and, and flaws and, and all that kind of stuff. But I do get to see what kind of ties together, what some of what some of the traits that are common amongst those that truly succeed and, and amongst those that don't. Um, so that goes outside of the finance side of things as well. But sticking mainly to finance, I think if you do understand, if you've got a good understanding of you know, how different products work, how they function, how they can be used to be to help you invest creatively, you are ahead of the game. You you will be able to um to, to, to do what others can't do. Um, a lot of the time I speak to my clients and I say to them, you know, they, some somebody that maybe is quite new into property, they say, oh, you know, I found my, I found a deal and I tell them that it, ca it can't really work for them because of the finance that's available to them personally. And they say, well, does that mean that it's not a deal? And I say, no, it is a deal, just not for you. It's a deal for somebody else that can get the finance needed to make this a deal. The finance available to you is too expensive and it, and it kicks you out or, you know, you need to borrow too much because and you don't have the, the funds available to, to put some skin in the game yourself or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, um, I go, I guess I could do a little bit of a brief overview as to some different, I guess, finance products, particularly the ones that we work with with our clients. And I should say as a bit of a caveat, at my company is a property um, finance company for property investors and developers. We do very little in the way of residential mortgages. We seem to have a niche where we do residential mortgages for property investors that need to raise cash to invest in property. Um, that seems to be our, our main focus when it comes to the resi stuff. We are a, we are an FCA re regulated company, but it's not really the focus of what we do. Um, and um, yeah, we can sort of maybe go through some of those uh, different products and how they're used. And then we can, you know, I'm, I'm quite keen, as I said before, to go into Q&A as early as possible because I want to make sure that what we discuss on here is actually valuable for you guys. I can sit here all day and spout stuff about finance, but it needs to be relevant to what you guys are actually doing. Um, so I suppose to kick off, we'll we'll, we'll go in this sort of two categories really of, of finance and that's mortgages and more specialist stuff. So we kick off with the different types of mortgages um, that, we, that we cover. Um, so first and foremost, you've got your standard buy to let mortgages, uh, your mortgages for uh, for personal owned properties and limited companies. You've got mortgages for HMOs. You've got mortgages for service accommodation slash holiday lets. There is a difference. We'll have a quick chat about that. Um, and um, and social housing, which is a big one that seems to be on the rise at the moment. Um, so let's talk about just buy to lets to start with. Now, most people um, don't truly understand how lenders determine how much you can borrow on a buy to let mortgage um it's uh people still believe there's some sort of affordability calculation that occurs based on your personal circumstances now your personal circumstances are important whether you're buying in personal name or not 
a limited company is purely there. Let's not sugarcoat it. It's there for tax reasons, isn't it? Lenders know that. They still want to know about you. You are you personally are still seen as the applicant. Um, but how much they can lend you is based on how much the property makes, not how much you make in terms of income. So lenders use something called a rental calculator to, to work this out. Um, I won't go through it because there's various sorts of, uh, sort of iterations, but essentially... The higher the yield, the more likely you are to be able to achieve that perf, you know, that that magic seventy five percent loan to value, which most um, most of my clients um, aim for. Um, there is a good reason why we don't want to necessarily exceed that. By the way, guys, once you've got four or more properties, you become a property um, a sort of portfolio landlord, and essentially lenders see you as a professional. And there are some additional bits of due diligence and paperwork that needs to be done with lenders when that happens, one of which is a background portfolio stress test. And if you are leveraged, i.e. your loan to value is above 75% across the board, that's probably going to start causing you a few issues. So I'm, I'm probably one of the only brokers out there that's going to tell you to borrow less. Um, and uh, bearing in mind, we generally get paid on a percentage basis of how much you borrow. You can take that as I'm genuinely giving you um, giving you good uh, uh uh, good advice there because it's actually to my personal financial detriment um so yeah buy buy to lets are available buy to let mortgages are available to first time buyer first time landlords uh generally speaking though we need to prove that it's not what we call a backdoor residential um so that you, you basically you can't afford to buy your own home because of affordability on a residential mortgage you do it on a buy to let and then you move into it as long as we can prove that that's very very unlikely um then there are lenders out there for that there are also lenders available for first time uh investors that's becoming much much more widespread now um, as long as you've got one property um i.e your own main residential home there are lots more lenders that are happy to, to, to lend on that basis. Um, and um, and there are there are more lenders probably than ever before that will lend to limited companies as well. We just had a big, uh, big lender, Metro Bank, uh, the latest lender to to allow for um, uh, for limited company purchase as well. It's big. I would probably say that of our our client sell at Grand Union Finance. 80% plus, if not more, um, are, are now investing using a limited company. But um, as uh, as Yogesh said uh, very well uh, earlier on, um, the, you know, the best thing to do is to find the right tax advisor that has a, a real understanding of property to advise you on what the best structure is for you. Um, that's the basic sort of buy to let stuff. Um, also, I know a lot of people are doing the BRR, buy refurbish refinance model. Um, there is a myth that you can't refinance a property unless you've owned it for six months. It's a load of rubbish. Um, we, I would, I again, I reckon of the remortgages that we do, at least half are pre six months after a purchase. Um, our standard exit from a bridging loan that we arrange is probably five to seven months on a BRR. Sometimes it's a, it's a lot lower than that. Believe it or not, recently, and this is a nice segue into the HMO stuff, um, we I had a client who purchased a property, a C3 classified property, converting it into a C4 HMO, and we completed the remortgage before four months of ownership had elapsed. So number one, he had an amazing build team because um, the work that was done was done in an astonishingly quick time. But we were also quite fortunate at that time. The best lender for him was also working quite quickly. Um, and we managed to get that through um, at lightning quick pace, Tom. Uh, we, we got that done in. So uh, so that just goes to show that in, the, in my intro, we, we it, some of it was correct anyway. Um, so HMO mortgages, um, again, let's talk about it, uh, comparing it to, um, to buy to lets. H, um, a lot fewer lenders are going to lend to you if you're a first time investor on an HMO mortgage than they will do on a buy to let. It's seen as an advanced strategy. It's seen as more risky from a lender's point of view. So they're going to be a little bit more reluctant on the whole to lend to you if you're a first time investor. First time buyers <laughs> and first time investors is going to be a real struggle. When I say there's a handful, we are talking less than less than five probably lenders in the market. Re, like reasonable lenders when we're, we're not going off to our togethers here to get mortgages uh where they're going to charge you nine percent for a, for an hmo mortgage we're talking sort of more standard lenders uh that would lend to a first time buyer first time landlord on an hmo basis um but again they are actually very very similar to um to, to buy to let mortgages how much you can borrow is based on the, the income generally speaking the rental calculators that are used are the same for hmos as they are for buy to lets and therefore the yields are obviously considerably more so i can't remember the last time that we struggled to get to that magic 75 percent loan to value 
um, on an HMO mortgage because the yields are just that good. You want to be wary of a few things, though. Um, lenders will have will take not only instruction and guidance from local authorities as to the minimum requirements for HMOs. Room size is key. Um, um, uh, communal areas also key. Um, but they some lenders will actually have Make, um, criteria over and above that as well. So if whatever local council has, you know, certain regulations, some lenders will supersede that with additional things like the, you know, it might be a certain square meterage of communal space, but the lender actually wants more than that for any property that they are, are lending on. So always be very, very aware of that. Um, the big one though with HMO mortgages, I think at the moment is, can I get a commercial valuation for my HMO mortgage? Um, the answer is yes, but we have to hit a lot of criteria. Generally speaking, if it's sui generis in classification, so seven bedroom, uh, seven people or more residing in that property, um, then there are lenders out there that can give us that commercial yield based valuation. And essentially how that works is we'll take 75% of the annual rent roll. Um, and the reason why it's 75% is that they generally take off 20 5% for maintenance and management. And then the uh, we would divide that by whatever the local yield is. So generally speaking, that's somewhere between I find eight and 14%. That gives us our commercial valuation. Um, that's not an exact science, by the way, guys, there are uh, some variations of that formula, but that's a good one to work to. Um, outside of sui generis, <clears throat> a lender is only going to lend on a commercial uh, valuation basis if it's what we would call a true HMO and for rule of thumb let's just say it's all en suite and it's really got to be six sometimes maybe five bed but you're not going to be getting commercial valuations on three and four bed HMOs uh, they're too easily converted back into family homes which if you borrow money on a commercial basis could then lead to you being um being in negative equity so um commercial valuations certainly possible on HMOs Service accommodation and holiday lets, it's a relatively new market. The holiday let thing has been around for a while, but the, the, the movement into a more service accommodation style um, mortgage uh, is, is relatively new. Rule of thumb, guys, if it's service accommodation, short lets, the lender's usually going to work out their rental calculator on a standard AST rental, not the actual rental that you're going to get. Um, but apart from that, it's pretty much the same as a standard a standard mortgage. They're going to want to know that the property is in an area that is not, um, you know, purely just for holiday homes, like some sort of holiday park or something like that. So city centre flats and that kind of stuff, absolutely perfect for that sort of thing. Um, and again, as I said, how much you can borrow on a, on a rental calculator will be based on the standard AST income um, for stuff like that. Social housing is, is something that we're doing a lot of at the moment. Um, I, I seem to fall into that a few years ago and became known for knowing how to get mortgages on social housing projects. The key to this is the lease, guys. Um, Social housing is not a product, it's a criteria point. So these are generally HMO mortgages with lenders that are comfortable with longer leases. If we want to go with a more standard part of the market, um, then you know, leases need to be less than five, five years. Um, and they want to they need to be with reputable social housing providers. If you want to find out what a, a reputable social housing provider looks like, um, just Google government social housing provider register and it will give you a list. Outside of that, Mears and Circo are the two ones. Um, the lenders are a little bit more favorable too. But again, very, very, very small pool of lenders on this, guys. So just be very, very well aware of that. If you are venturing into this, um, please speak to either a very, very good mortgage broker or myself and my team, um, because we can give you an indication as to whether it's even going to be possible for you. So that's the kind of the mortgage side. Um, I'm, I'm wary of time, but sort of going into uh, a little bit more on the specialist side, you're bridging development finance and commercial mortgages. I won't go into too much detail because I'm happy for you guys to answer me question, ask uh, ask me questions on this. But essentially, bridging if you can learn how to use bridging, you go you get to be in the top ten percent of all more, of all uh, in, uh, investors in the country. Um, it is an incredible tool that gets a massively bad rep. Um, so you know it's uh, it's 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 amazing. It's so flexible. It's so quick. I've beaten um, I've beaten cash buyers with bridging. Um, so when I've spoken to agents and I've said. I don't care, pit us against that cash buyer, we'll beat them. And they're laughing, they're laughing me off the phone. Actually, um, we've done that on numerous occasions. So as long as you know the process and you understand how it works and you pick the right lender, it can be done in days, not weeks. Um, development finance, 
it, a lot of people think that it's a little bit like bridging. It is a little bit like bridging, but it's not bridging. It's not a quick product, you know, so don't think, oh, I'm going to use development finance to buy a property at auction. That's going to be highly unlikely. Development finance is a specialist type of finance that is particularly for developing properties. It's where we're borrowing a bit of money day one to go towards the purchase. And then we're borrowing usually 100% of the bill costs as well. So we only have to put in uh, that little bit more, a um, little bit of money to, to get things rolling. The, uh, the the amount that we're, we're drawing down as a facility um, is in stage payments in arrears. So you need to front up a little bit of cash, but it's um, it's a great product and uh, and very worthwhile learning about. Um, also, commercial mortgages. Um, I don't know what the uh, what the the interest is in that in the room. So just to keep it very very high level, commercial mortgages very similar to to standard mortgages in a way. We've got residential, which is basically owner occupied, so it's maybe the office that you you occupy yourself, and then you've got investment, and they work in a very similar way to residential versus buy to let. The investment is all down to the income that you're getting, so the lease. Um, and then on the owner occupied side, it's going to be down to your viability as a, as a business to pay that monthly mortgage payment. And we work that out using EBITDA, which essentially is like a way of working out um, net net income. So that gives you a flavor of lots of different finance products. And I guess maybe the, the Q&A that we can go into now, obviously, if you've got any particular questions, happy days, we'll go through anything you want. But maybe we can think about different strategies where different products would would work with and we can talk through sort of maybe how those work so i did say it was going to be quick tom i think i was a bit longer than quick wasn't i you were but that's a good thing um covered a lot so appreciate it uh, i think it's really good stuff yeah i've done this before um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah not your first rodeo huh? she's yeah. she's good um i think uh this is going to sound like I'm damning you with faint praise and hopefully the opposite is true, which is I think that'd be really good for beginners, brackets, advanced people as well. But but for good for beginners, because you you, you talked in, and I think this is an underrated skill, you talked about difficult things uh, and made them relatively simple. Um, so I think a lot of people appreciate that, especially property investors, because we uh, are typically a generalist um we have to do it we have to understand lots of different things everything from um how to buy the thing where to get some money from maybe how to raise that money right through to how to get lending to complete the the finance picture right through to hey what light shades do we need to make this room look good and we don't need to of course be designers and mortgage brokers and all the rest of it but we need to know how to work with people um or know people who know how to work with people because uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but but property business is a, is, is a people business, I think. Um, so I think that's really useful for people. I hope so. Anyway, it's it, certainly useful sort of canter through things for me. And uh, uh, really, Do you know, so you, you, you raise a really good point there, Tom. Just just to quickly uh, jump on that, um, there, there's this whole buzzword, isn't it? The, the power team, you know. Um, and I, I think it's because it's a buzzword, it gets it gets swept under the carpet as something. Oh, it's just a buzz phrase. It's so so important. Um, I when when I'm working with a lender, so for a, a, bridge, a bridge, bridging lenders are a great, great um, example of this because they all work in such a different way. We as a brokerage do something that I think is relatively unique, and I've had this back from lenders, um, is that we ask the lenders how they want us to work, right? Mm. Because I know that if we do things the way they want us to do it, they're going to be more susceptible to it, and they're going to want to work with us. They're going to get the job done, and the whole process is going to go a lot quicker. When working with certain clients, one thing that differentiates, again, the good from the bad, and this, this isn't me being sort of um, sort of selfish in terms of, you know, oh, I really want, I want people to work the way I want to work. It's if I've got a client that comes to me and says, right, Sam, what do you need from me? And I say, I need this. And they get, and they give it to me or, or one of my team or whatever. Um, that job gets done quickly. When I have people that fight against me, that makes the job harder and it's human nature for us to then sort of not switch off from those people but to not maybe not prioritize prioritize those as much as somebody else is doing doing what i said previously so i think when you're working whether it's with a broker or any person within your power team think about what makes life easier for them and your relationship will ultimately be a hell of a lot better um and you will get what you need from them a lot more your relationship will become a hell of a lot better and ultimately you will become a better property investor off the back of it because you will have access to some of the best people i have that have that niche knowledge of that certain area in the market because they're going to want to work with you in return it's a two-way street it's a relationship so there's a good point that you made tom and i thought i'd just jump to the back of that 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I remember. I can't remember who it was. Someone might be able to help me, but someone said loyalty is isn't isn't using someone you know to be brilliant. Loyalty is sticking around when you know the person's no longer the best or cheapest in the market. Now, you get to decide whether to be loyal or not. But I've probably got people I work with who I'm loyal to, by which I mean they're no longer the cheapest option I've got or the best. But I stick with them because I've been with them for 10, 15 years, and I'm prepared to give them a chance to turn it round. Um, because maybe I am. Um, I won't name names, obviously, but I had someone I worked with who broke away to form their own company. So over the first year or so, it was a bit ropey um, because it always is. And I, I get that because it's difficult to start your own business, as you touched on earlier. And so I gave them a chance, um, and I'm glad I did because now the service is back and I've got a relationship with that person, and you can tell they try and help me out. So I'd, I'd echo that. Uh, top tip as well is uh, in terms of trades people, what they want is paying quickly. If anyone's listening, um, that's, that's been my long-held experience and belief. So uh, if you're just starting, out that's the top tip um is if you pay your trades quickly they'll thank you for it even if they're bad trades because you don't have to work with them again <laughs> but they'll uh, the good ones will, will like it too right uh i've made some i've made some notes of questions as you were talking so i'm going to come up with questions and then we've got some in the chat feel free anyone to pipe up or stick some more in the chat and we'll we'll get through as many as we can um uh you mentioned that for a while you worked at some big companies worked at things like you mentioned savills and maybe some others what was the what was the good and bad of that? Or what did you learn from that? I imagine it's difficult to summarize what you learned in potentially many years working for a firm, but uh, what did you learn about how big firms work? Because obviously doing what you do now, you work with big firms. You may become a big firm one day, who knows? Um, so did that inform how you work or, or did you did you just hate every minute of it or love every minute of it? How was that? No, not, not at all. I didn't hate any, uh, every minute of it at all. It's, um, it, it's when you, uh, I... I, I call myself a bad employee. And the reason why I call myself a bad employee, because um, I think not necessarily would, would I like a me, I'm not too sure, but from the companies I worked with, I get very passionate, very involved, and I want to do everything I can. I become like the greatest fan of that brand. Um, so when I was at Savills, you know, I, I don't think I ever had a conversation during that time that didn't involve Savills in some way, shape or form. I was their biggest advocate. I wanted to be involved in absolutely everything. So I was very fortunate in every single company that I've ever been involved with, pretty much, I have pushed myself to be involved in the workings of what they do a lot more. You know, at Savills, I was tasked with basically building the, the country's first ever kind of para planner division of um uh, of, a, of a mortgage brokerage and that included the short-term specialist finance commercial finance side of things as well so it was a big ask and we and we we achieved it um when i worked for a company called ennis who at the time were quite small but are now a global brand um i was in charge of all of their um business development lead generation marketing stuff um so again i got a great insight into what made the owners tick and, and and what they did. I think what I learned was um, too many companies treat their employees like a number um, and I don't do that. Um, and I, and I, I really, truly hope I never will. Um, the, the positives of some of these larger companies is their belief in systems and processes. And I think as a property investor, Again, going the, the theme of this will probably be what makes a good property investor having a really, really streamlined system and process, avoiding chaos as often as possible is is a, is a massive thing. And as a business owner now, you know, as any as many of you will probably know by running your own property businesses and maybe other businesses, is you know, daily it's it is like a, it is just chaos. You know, you, it's a roller coaster. You wake up feeling like crap, and two hours later you're brilliant, and then you crap a bit again, and it's all over the place. The more you can control that with systems and processes, the better. And the big companies certainly have that. The smaller companies, their attention to the to customer service, generally speaking, was a lot more. So what I'm trying to do at Grand Union is merge those things together to have that big company feeling of systems, processes, technology. Uh, presence coupled with that loving you know arm over your shoulder customer service you know I, I we have an internal like minimum standard that we never go two days without having a community having communication with a client that has an active case with us um, a lot of the time it's better than that um, we have internal SLAs um, sorry these are service level agreements in the industry so sort of time frames that we mean to, to to reach certain parts of the process and we also have a little bit of a joke in house as well, which I which I find 
funny telling everyone about, which is we all know that agents are the ones that are usually hammering at you constantly. What's going on? What's happening? What's, you know, and uh, we try and take the burden off our clients by saying, just introduce us to the agent straight away and we'll let them contact us. Don't, don't worry about them. We have a joke in house. We try and get it to the point where the agent tells us we don't need to communicate with them as much as we are. Um, and if anyone gets that email, they win a drink of their choice. <laughs> so that's actually something we do internally. Um, so, uh, so as you can tell, like we're, we're trying to, we're trying to merge those things. So yeah, it's um, working for all those different companies. It taught me two things. Number one, um, I should be working for myself. <laughs> um, and, and, but number two, it taught me, I, I learned a lot of what to do and a lot of what not to do, because there was not one company that had it absolutely perfect, but there was also not one company that had it all wrong either. Every company was doing something right, in my humble opinion. So it's about trying to cultivate all of those different aspects and merging them together to create what I hope, you know, my, my, my goal is that we will one day be the biggest and best um, mortgage brokerage in the country, spe you know, specifically working with property investors and developers. We're not gonna get there by not being brilliant at everything. Sure. Yeah, sounds right. I I was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking I'd like to start treating people as a number, but it's difficult, and that's in single single digits. Um, it's, <laughs> if you're gonna, it's difficult to treat someone as number seven, in it? You know, like yeah. Uh, yeah. you should probably know who that person is. Exactly. Uh, so that's yeah. I've got to, got, got to grow a bit more before I can start. I dream of, of treating people like a number. Uh, uh, that aside, um, I've got a friend who's a, um, well, also a mentoring client, and they've been told by a broker that they uh, couldn't get a buy to let. And I realise everyone's individual situations, of course, different. But generally speaking, uh, and certainly in this in this case, couldn't get a buy to let until they'd bought their own house. I was thinking to myself, if Richard Branson hadn't bought his own house, he has, he's bought his own island with a house on it. But if he hadn't bought his own house, I was a multimillionaire or billionaire, and turned and said, oh, I haven't got my own house, we're going to have a buy to let. I think he'd probably be told, yeah, you're all right, we'll sort you out, because you're worth like billions of quid. So... um so I said, this is what I told my mentoring client, and I said he should probably go and at least get that checked out. We'll get a second opinion to make sure that was true. Because I didn't say I don't, I don't think it's not true, but um, it may be true for him because he's not he's not Richard Branson. But I was thinking, how does that work rule wise? When I started out, but this is a long time ago, I was able to get my first buy to let without, um, and I didn't own property. But again, rules have changed over the years. How does that work, especially thinking about? younger or newer people who are listening and um, can try and get the first one and maybe they haven't got their own house yet or they've only got a residential property and they've been told they can't get a buy to let. Is that, is that strictly true or does it, does it just depend so much? Yeah. So for a little bit of a, a little bit of context, uh, when you got your first mortgage, Tom, probably you just had to sign Mickey Mouse at the bottom of a piece of paper and you've got, you've got a mortgage. <laughs> the um, because... yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit different back then, but um, it, we have to talk about isolated criteria here as an isolated criteria point. Can you get a mortgage if you're a first time buyer, first time landlord? Yes, you can. Mm. So I would imagine that the reason why that individual couldn't get a mortgage was because of another criteria point on top of that. Generally speaking, if you're a first time buyer, first time investor, you um, you will need there, there's some additional criteria points that you might need to hit um, that are not that somebody that already owns their own home might not have to. So mm. one example might be. As, although I said earlier on, your income doesn't play a role in how much you can borrow on a buy to let, some lenders will still have what we call a minimum income requirement, which means essentially it's like a cutoff point. It's like it's like a job application that says you can't apply for it unless you've got a 2-1 at university, you know? Um, if you don't earn £25,000 a year and you can't and you can't prove that, um, then we're going to decline you regardless. Sometimes for first-time buyer, first-time landlords, that's increased. I know one lender that has a £70,000 minimum income requirement if you're a first-time buyer, first-time landlord. It just mm. de-risks it from their perspective because yeah. they're going, if you genuinely have no idea what you're doing, you've got a bit of money in the background that probably means we're going to get paid our, our mortgage. So it's just understanding those other things as well. Some lenders also will treat you a little bit like a residential owner. So if you're a first-time buyer, first-time landlord, they might still make you go through an, an affordability assessment similar to a residential um a mortgage application just to make sure like nat west are a great example of, of a lender that does that um they they will put you through a, a standard residential affordability calculator to ensure you could afford this property as a red, residential home because again it de-risks because they're concerned you're going to buy it as a buy to let but then actually end up living in it which would contradict um uh, the the regulation and ultimately that is actually fraud uh, just as a heads up guys i don't like using the f word too often um but i will what well, i will use it when necessary and that that is fraud so um you want to avoid doing doing that sort of stuff 
Well, we said at the, said at the outset we might have the odd unplanned swear word, and uh, we've 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 got one. Um, so uh, we've got questions from Julian from Yogesh. I'm going to hand up to give them both a heads up. We're going to ask one more question, then and over to Yogesh if he's still here. I think he is, uh, and then over to Julie to ask your own questions, mostly because I don't understand them. Um, and uh, <laughs> better if you're asking me, then you'd be more likely to get the an a good answer. But before I do, one last one for me was um, you mentioned. Uh, that of course you work with lots of different people and um, so you get a unique perspective on the industry working with different investors, good, bad, ugly, big, small, all the rest of it, all you know, what's and all. And you mentioned that one thing that you thought was um, a trait of successful entrepreneurs, I think I'm, I don't think I'm taking words out of your mouth, it'll stop when I go wrong, was having good systems in place. Um, are there any others? I guess I'm, I'm thinking about our wider, our audience here today, but also our wider audience on the podcast, um, listening, thinking, yeah, I wonder what this gentleman's learned from dealing, dealing with lots of different investors. Because invest, investing can be a lonely business. We have the odd networking meeting like this one, but often you can go days, weeks, or months without speaking to a fellow investor. If you do, you speak to one or two. So it's nice to know what the good ones are doing uh, and the bad ones come to that. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Uh, three things I'd say. Um, the first would be to, to, to sort of jump off exactly your, your last point is so just surround yourself with people. Go to networking events as often as you can. You know, I think I actually think there's a bit of a resurgence in the traditional uh, property, you know, uh, uh, carpets and curtains type holiday in events. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it. Go along. If you don't want to sit sit through the crap talks at a pin, um, go for the beginning Go and go and walk around the room. Get to get to know people. Chat. Follow up. Get go and have coffees with people, and then bugger off. Part of my French, you know. Um, don't you don't need to sit there and listen to the to the sales pitches. Um, you can just go just for the networking. You know, fill your boots with with um, with, with with contacts, and then and then and then follow up and and go and become friends with these people. I'm so lucky. I moved to Birmingham five years ago. I got the opportunity to change my circle of friends essentially, and all of the people that I hang out with up here are business owners. So I get to go out for a pint. And chat business, which is like the greatest thing to some people, that sounds like hell to me. That's just brilliant. So surrounding yourself with the right people, I think, is, is one boring one. Organ being organized. If you are not organized, find someone that is and employ them. I, I had I, I employed my mum. I had an operations director that I sadly let go recently for various reasons. But I also now have Danielle, who's our case manager, is freaking organized. She has her diary labeled every day. You know get get organized or get someone that is organized um, around you um, and the last one is to trust people and delegate to the people that know better than you there's no point being the person in the room that knows the most because you are getting zero from that um, I surround myself with people I, I'm I'm whenever I'm looking to take on new brokers I'm looking to take on brokers that might know more than I do because I I'm a, I'm a good broker I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I'm not um but I'm not good at, every, I can't be perfect at absolutely every aspect. One thing I am good at, I think, is translating the complex into the, into the less complex, which makes me good as a business owner, particularly when working in finance. And I have an overarching understanding of the, the economics of the financial world, which allows me to be quite a good um, business development manager, essentially, for my, for my company. Um, but I'm always looking to bring in people that are better at, than me um into my company danielle i've already mentioned she is better at administrative tasks and managing cases and checking documents than i am um chanel who's one of my one of my brokers who had a record month last month you know she is she her ability to to get a client to buy into her is second to none it's amazing it's a great thing for her to have that i can pass someone to her and and she'll and, and they'll they'll work together really well straight away you know surrounding yourself with people that are better at you and trusting that they're better in you that you um at these things and um will 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 we'll help you out massively mass you don't you don't need to go it alone and, and if anything um name name me a successful person that has gone it alone um and i'll and i'll i'll call you a liar probably Buddha. was he was he on his own do you have a lot of mates I'm not, I'm to like, be honest I'm there's not a lot of them in, not all of them in those orange robes isn't there <laughs> it's true um yogesh have you got a question and more importantly are you there if so, do you want to fire away? He's not going to pick up at the moment. Yeah, well, he's um. Uh, well, why don't we go with Julie? Because I can see Julie's here, and then if Yogesh turns up, he can he can pipe up with a question. Hello, Julie. It's not my question, Tom. It's a really good question, but <laughs> have I attributed? Else. Have I misattributed my poor eyesight? It's to John, I think. <laughs> it's from John. John. 
John, even better. Uh, sorry, Julie. It starts with a J. That was good enough for my for my brain. Uh, hello, John. Do you want to do you want to ask your question, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sam, for the presentation. It was in the context of BRR, and uh, I've had investors. Anyway, I'm just curious. I had investors. They they find they refurbish their property, then they they make evaluation, which they take the lender, and then the lender says this is not like the actual valuation. Then they end up not getting the money they wanted. And of course they end up in frustration, especially when they have taken up like bridging finance and they can't pay the loan. So how do you deal with that or how do you avoid it? Yeah, this is um this this is a really, really good question, and thanks for the feedback as well. Um so I'm gonna say something controversial. That's the C word this time. I've used the F word, now I'm using the C word, controversial. Um in my experience, there is a really good reason why on BRR refinances, we get down valuations. And for those listening, I'm using inverted commas, is because the, the, the investor is wrong. It's because that is not the value of their property. They are, they haven't got the available proof that what they believe the property is worth is actually the value of that property. Um, don't forget, guys, that. We all hate valuers uh, and surveyors, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna open that that can of worms on um, the fact that surveyors are the only people are, are, as part of this process that get paid regardless of the quality of the work that they do. Um, and I do think it's a part of the process that needs to be revolutionised. We're seeing the advocate of um, of AVMs, automated valuations, desktop valuations, a lot more nowadays, particularly in the residential and bridging space. Um, but we still have surveyors to work with. But don't forget, guys, surveyors are qualified individuals we're not talking about estate agents here where you can just turn up one morning put a suit that your dad wore 10 years ago on and go out and sell houses we're talking about someone that's gone through a vigorous uh, and rigorous um, university degree oh. in learning about uh, property investing uh, sorry in learning about the property market and they also have all the data at their disposal at their disposal to make a good decision as well so if look, I'm not I'm not sitting here saying that I haven't seen survey reports that are absolutely terrible, but I see about ten a week, you know. So the chances of me seeing a terrible one are quite high, but the majority are fine. And a lot of the time, it's the investors themselves that have over egged or overemphasized what they believe that property is going to be worth because they are playing it glass half full in life. I play it glass half full. In business, I play it realistic and pessimistic and get a nice surprise at the end. The, the way to look at this, John, is um, a, a, an estate agent will value a property based on what they believe it could be worth in the future, i.e. if they put it on the market now, what could they sell it for in the coming weeks and months? A, a, a valuer, a mortgage valuer, is looking to the past. What have properties sold for recently? What are the indexes from Halifax and Nationwide telling us about the property market in this area. So generally speaking, the difference between the two, particularly in an upward market, is going to be a 5 to 10% margin sometimes. So I think whenever, and you talked about how do we get around this? Well, I think getting around it is the wrong thing. And by the way, just as a little, a little, uh, a little tip, when we're remortgaging a BRR, if the if the if the reason that we're doing that is to pull as much money out as we possibly can, let's shoot for the stars when it comes to the the figure that we're going to put on our our remortgage application. If we think it's worth one ten, let's put one twenty five on that mortgage application because I in my in my career only two has only been two occasions where the valuer has come back with a valuation higher than what we have put on the application. So always shoot higher on the application, knowing that it's, it may very well come down. If we put it at 110, it might the lender the uh, the valuer might come in at 105. If we put it at 125, they might come in at 110. It's just how how it works. Um, they, they've got no um, incentive to go above that figure that's on that application form. But we can just be a little bit more... Um, uh, we can just do a little bit more due diligence from the outset on what we believe the value of that property is likely to be at the end. Let's look at in a bit more detail. Let's look at sales comparables and let's do it properly. Let's look at it how a valuer is going to look at it. Let's not just look at s properties on that street or a few streets around. Let's look at is it are they is it the same spec? Is it the same number of bedrooms? Is it the same type of property? End terrace versus mid terrace different different type of property from a lender's point of view um square square footage is it similar 
you know, amenities? Um, has it got a, uh, you know, a, a parking space? Has it got a driveway or, or, or stuff like that? That's the level of detail a good property investor goes to when doing their due diligence on the end values, or as we call it in, in the professional side of things, GDV, gross development value. That's the level you want to be going to. Um, and I would always, always, always stress test that by taking 10% off of it. If you think it's going to be worth 100 grand at the end, let's 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 see if the deal still works at 80, you know. And if you're doing that, that's what the best investors are out there doing. They're, they're, they're hoping for the best, but they're preparing for the worst. And often, unfortunately, when it comes to valuers, we do get that that worst uh, worst case scenario. We do have a little bit of influence over different uh, valuers as well. Look, don't go and get, you know, Connells to, to value an HMO because they're going to have a fit. Um, you know, we want a specialist HMO valuer to go out and value those properties. So that that's what some of the things we can do as well. But on the whole, I know I know it's not not necessarily the nice thing to hear, John, but I, I find in my experience a lot of the time, it's just because the 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 investors got their, their numbers wrong, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. Um we're now going to play, we're going to do excellent answer. We're going to do uh, a new section I've just invented called uh, Quick Fire Lies. Um, I've nicked that from a radio show, haven't I? Um, or a TV show. So uh, answers on a postcard where I've nicked that from because I can't remember. So uh, just we've only got a few minutes left. So I'm going to try and squeeze in uh, the other questions we've got. Uh, the next one is also one of John's, which says, um, where's John's second question? It's here and says, uh, so you got, I don't know, 15 to 30 seconds max on each of these, just for a laugh. Uh, Sam, do you offer mortgages for flats with short leases and how do you determine the value of the property? Um, yes, we do. Um, I've got a really good story about it, which I don't think I have time to, to tell you, unfortunately. But um, generally speaking, if it's a short lease property, if it's under 60 years left on the lease, um, mortgage lenders aren't going to lend on them. But we can get bridging finance to uh, to purchase them, uh, coincide that with, uh, with uh, increasing the, the lease. And we can actually get the bridging lender sometimes to cover the cost of that lease extension as well and then we can refinance basically treat it like a brr okay excellent stuff um yeah good stuff uh, uh your guess who uh, wrote this question i think wandered off but anyway I i'll ask it so supported tenants providers i'm guessing that means like supported um social yeah. housing providers uh seems like lenders are shying away paragon used to do it but now declined other lenders who still do this um it is it's a tiny market um Basically, lenders don't like it because uh, they see it as a reputational risk. Um, so if they are, if you do not keep up repayments of, the, of your mortgage and they have to repossess, they could be seen to be turfing out vulnerable tenants and it only needs, you know, the mirror to get hold of that. And suddenly there's a front page uh, news story about it, com probably completely out of context. Um, in reality, that won't happen. Um, and I've spoken to loads of lenders about this, but it's down to their funding lines and it, and it, it doesn't help. The other one is people say it's guaranteed rent well the, the trick to this is who's actually guaranteeing the rent and unfortunately and i've got clients where this has happened so i've got one client where he had 45 units that were all, were all leased to the same supported living provider that went bankrupt and he suddenly was faced with the fact that he had 45 um, lots of mortgage payments to pay next month with zero income from them um so lenders are also reluctant to lend on because of that because they don't actually know who's guaranteeing that rent and it's difficult to do the necessary due diligence and the market is actually still quite small so it's 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 not it's not there i'm hoping it will grow um i'm doing my best i feel like a one-man army uh with lenders at the moment trying to push them into doing this there are lenders that do it we've got to fit a square peg into a square hole but it is doable but there just there just isn't a lot of lenders out there that will look at it Fitting a square peg into a square hole feels all right, to be honest. Isn't the I mean, yeah. Peg in the uh, my, my, my job, my job is trying to turn a, a, create, a, a, the a create, create the square peg. Yeah, I think that's my, my my main job. Yeah, currently we've got the round peg, I imagine, uh, at best. Um, if people, I'm sure people will, because they'll be excited by the lightning speed and the, um, the transformer style energy that you've got. Um, if people want to get a, get a touch, get a hold of you, well, of course, publish your contact details with the podcast. But people are lazy, so what should people Google or look up or find you on Instagram or whatever? Um, you can all you can Google Grand Union Finance, and uh, we will come up top, um, and you'll see all our five star reviews. Uh, but if you want to come and just follow me, the best thing to do is just follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm very I'm posting videos every single day. I go live every Monday at five p. 
PM. And I've been doing that for 202 weeks on the trot where I answer all your questions live. Um, so you can follow me at the T-H-E Sam, S-A-M Norris, like Chuck and Lando with an N, not an M. Uh, so at the Sam Norris, that's, and just send me a DM if you've got any questions. And if you want to book a call with me, I can send you a link um, to booking a call with either me or the team. And um, yeah, we're, we're here to help with all of your financial needs. That was a uh, grand union finance for anyone who, who missed that. Um, That's right. Thanks, uh, everyone, for attending. Particular thanks, of course, to uh, our speaker, Sam, who um, we might have to have back on so we can tell us that funny story, although that would leave us about 38 minutes um, <laughs> or whatever to fill. But uh, who knows? We might get him back on. Um, and uh, appreciate all being here. Hope everyone has a, a good weekend that you've enjoyed a listen and a watch.